for inviting me. Uh, I'm really honored to uh, be part of this seminar because so such so, such an incredible people is attending the seminar, and uh, well, it's a dream come true. So uh, today I'm gonna be presenting um, a really particular observation that we capture in Costa Rica just before the occurrence of two catastrophic landslides at the Irazú volcano, one of the main volcanoes or active, more active volcanoes in the country. Um, this is, of course, a collaboration with a few colleagues from the Opsicori, from the Volcanological and Seismological Observatory of Costa Rica, and also from people um, uh, that I'm, I work with in, up to in, in Santa Cruz, from, uh, for example, Susan Schwartz, Noah Finnegan, and Redwood Higman. Um, so let me let me go go ahead. So and, and, and if you have questions, uh, please feel uh, feel free to unmute yourself and or raise a hand and ask a question if something is not clear enough. I'll be happy to chat and 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 interact with with all of you. Okay, so I hope you can see my presentation well and the transitions are are going well too. Okay, so just to put this in context, uh, this is Costa Rica as part of the Central American Volcanic Front, where the Cocos Plate is abducting underneath the Caribbean Plate at, <clears throat> at a rate of about um, 85 to 90 millimeters per year. It's about 85 right here in the, in the northern section of, the, of Costa Rica and about 90 millimeters per year right here in the southern part of the country. As you can see, this rapid convergence range uh, generates large earthquakes right here under the southern, um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, right right under the Nicoya Peninsula in the northern part of the country, uh, with the potential for generating magnitude up to 7.9 earthquakes. And then in the southern part, we have we usually host earthquakes with magnitude no, no larger than 7.4. 7 <clears throat> in, the, in the middle of these two peninsulas, we have a very complex uh, bathymetry right here, where the Cocos Plate is um, full of seamount uh, chains that are subducting right underneath the country. And it is because of this subduction that we have volcanoes, uh, and we have a very prominent volcanic change right here in the central part of the country and then in the northern uh, part of the country. Right now and today, we're going to focus in the central part of the country where we have two main volcanoes. Uh, having fun, uh, usually. Right here in the map, you can see the Irasu volcano. This topographic anomaly corresponds to the Irasu volcano. And then the Triaba volcano that is right next to the Irasu volcano. But this is the, the volcano that we're gonna focus in. And the star, the orange star that you can see right here represents the epicenter of the landslide of, the largest landslide that have been occurring in the volcano in uh, in 2020. This event was massive, but we have a history of landslides that have been occurring in, in this part of the planet. Um, in triangles, I'm represented the seismic stations that are uh, installed uh, in, in these two volcanoes for a permanent monitoring of the you know, geodynamic activity of these two structures. As you can see, we have two stations right here, really close to the epicenter of the landslide. And this is giving us the capacity to observe things that uh, it is impossible to observe in other places. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you that in a couple of, of minutes. This volcano has a very long history of landslides, of course, of volcanic eruptions as well. Um, so for instance, we translate from the map that you can see in your left to the map in the right, you can see how uh, complex is the, the, geomorph the geomorphology of this structure. So we have a bunch of landslides that have been occurring right here in the past. Um, the star again represents the epicenter of the last event in 2020. Um, and, and you can see how uh, other landslides have been affecting the occurrence uh, or have been affecting the structure, the, the upper structure of the volcano. Monitoring landslides in volcanoes is especially important because you know the case of Mount St. Helens where 
uh, changes in the geomorphology can conduct to a very massive and destructive eruption. Um, and so it is important to keep an eye on everything that is happening on the volcano, but especially uh, surface events. Uh, in the Iresu volcano, we have a uh, previous history of massive events, ma massive landslides that uh, modify the geomorphology of the, of the structure. So for instance, in 1994, we had an event with 22 times 10 to the 6 meter cube, meters of material that went downhill. 2014, this is another big one, uh, 28 times 10 to the 6 meter cube. And then 2018, and the last one in 2020, it was this event was in August 2020, uh, generating a total mass, uh, total mass waste of 25 times 10 to the six meter cube. So 25 million of material went downhill uh, to one of the main rivers that pop, uh, that that are crossing the the volcano. Uh, thankfully, nobody was living there. Nobody was there, so no losses. Uh, no material damage, no material uh, uh, losses with the occurrence of this landslide. And now let's take a look at this uh, video that was created by a colleague of mine right here, uh, Cyril Mueller. And this is, uh, this is showing you the temporal evolution of the collapse uh, right before and after the, the landslide in 2020. So I'm gonna play this video a couple of times so you can see very well or in detail what's happening. So you can see right here by the yellow line, the evolution of the crack that is opening in one of the flanks of the volcano. You can see how the crack is tense and then boom, we have the collapse in August, uh, August 26. And this is the difference in altitude right uh, after the occurrence of the landslide. So let me play this video again so you can see it one more time. This is what happened during the landslide. And you can see the crack that is opening uh, at the top of at the summit of the volcano. Um, this is the day of the landslide days before, 19 August and the 26th. Here we go again. So let me pause it for a second. You can see right here in the rectangle, the yellow rectangle, how the crack starts opening, how the mass start, starts detach, uh, detaching from the base. And also something that I didn't mention before is that this volcano or the summit of the volcano is usually um, occupied by antennas for telecommunication. So the collapse of all of this mass would affect the internal communication of the country massively. So here you can start seeing the detachment of the mass that is forced by gravity. It's going downhill and boom, we have it. It is really impressive. Okay. Now, all right, let me move forward. Okay, so um, as, I, as I mentioned before, these collapse have been happening or these landslide have been happening since the 90s, right? is in the, 20, the 2000s where we have stations that are monitoring the volcano closely in, in the near field. And so we capture the evolution of the seismic evolution of the collapse in 2014. And so the figure that I'm showing you right here represents the seismic record of this landslide in 2014 by the two stations that are closest to the epicenter of the landslide in 2014. If you remember the map, we have two stations that are really close, really nearby. How close? Meters away from, from the summit where the landslide initiated, where the crack was opening, as, as you can, um, as if you remember in the video. So, um, 
we have two columns, three rows in this figure. Uh, one column is for station Vite and the other one is for station Bika. So these are two stations. And at the top of the figure, we have the spectrogram showing you the frequency as a function of time. This is relative time in hours from the occurrence of the landslide. And then we have the time domain waveforms of this event. So let's focus first on the time domain. If you look at the time domain signal, we have this, the, the collapse right here that is uh, signaled by this uh, gray arrow. And it is really hard to see the tiny things that are happening in the time domain. We have to zoom in just to grasp what is happening. We see a bunch of signals that are happening right before in a very systematic way with similar amplitude. Some of them are, are uh, very similar in shape as well before the landslide. So right here, we have the, 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 the records of the landslide. And if we move to the frequency domain, we start seeing um, the, well, of course we see the landslide right here in the time zero. And then we see a band of uh, signal that is formed right here. This is tremor that was formed right before the occurrence of the landslide. And if we move back in time, we're gonna see this is, uh, I like to, to, to call them the, 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 the the signals that are really energetic, well, are long period signals that are coming through this, the spectrogram that are really hard to see in the time domain. When we zoom in into the time domain, we can see the signals right here. And these are very low frequency earthquakes or low frequency earthquakes that are happening right before the occurrence of the tremor and then the landslide. Um, if we look at the at the other station, Station Bika, that is in your right, uh, we see something really interesting. And and uh, as well, you can see the occurrence of the of the landslide right here in the spectrogram, and then the tremor band that is forming uh, 30 minutes before the occurrence of the landslide, and then we have discrete events that are uh, preceding the occurrence of the tremor. These low frequency earthquakes, when you expand the signals, I'm going to show you the signal later, but when you expand the signal, you can notice that these are low frequency earthquakes uh, or low frequency signals. We, I still need to discriminate this, um, that are occurring right in the base or the, the, the interface. I like to call it interface between the mass that is going down and the base of the landslide. And 30 minutes before, uh, the occurrence of the landslide, it is impossible to separate these low frequency signals. They merge, they form tremor. And something interesting here is that the, the amplitude of the tremor increases exponentially right before the occurrence of the landslide. So this, this again is 2014. Let me move back, let me move to, uh, I'm gonna show you the, the records in 2020. So same figure, but just for a different time. This is 2020, same stations. Well, this is uh, station Aja that is also real, really close to, to the landslide and station Bika. Um, right here, the changes or this uh, seismic signatures are more dramatic, more consistent and more beautiful, I think because of course this landslide is, is larger and um, the features just show up beautifully and more, more clean. So again, in Station Aja, we focus in the Station Aja, we see the, the occurrence of the landslide right here that corresponds well with the time domain record of the event. And then we see this yellow band that is low frequency that is forming, and then we observe the discrete occurrence of events as well that are popping off, pop, 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 pop. time before, hours before the occurrence of the landslide. And then again, 30 minutes before the occurrence of the landslide, we have the formation of the, of the tremor band. Again, in the time domain, if we zoom in, we will see the discrete occurrence of these low frequency earthquakes, right? And then 30 minutes before the tremor uh, starts forming. The low frequency earthquakes are impossible to separate. Actually, the coda of the low frequency earthquakes starts merging with the first arrival of the next event and so on and so forth till they are collapsed into one tremor band and it is, it is impossible to separate. The amplitude of the tremor increases over time exponentially and then there is a 
sudden moment of silence right before the unstable sleep or the catastrophic collapse of the event and everything goes off. Um, okay, so this is what is happening. It, it, it has been repeating uh, in 2014 and then 2020. I, it is possible that this process have been happening in the same manner uh, way, for every landslide, but we don't have the records uh, in the near field for that. So it is it is it's very sad to to not have these records and and see what what happened uh, years before. But nature is repeating itself twice, so it's given us an idea and a very good idea of, of what could be the 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 process of the fall of the physics of the fall right right before the instability, before the, the catastrophic collapse of these massive events. So I counted or we counted the number of low frequency signals or low frequency earthquakes right before the landslide in 2014. And we observed some, something interesting. We observe a very chaotic uh, inter-event inter time. This is uh, the, the y-axis is inter-event time and the x-axis is time before the collapse, where zero time represents the occurrence of the collapse in 2014. So right before the collapse, we see this uh, linear decay in the low frequency earthquakes um, that anticipate the occurrence of the, of the collapse of the, of the landslide in 2014. But hours before, uh, 150 hours before, the, the low frequency earthquakes start occurring, and the inter-event time is more chaotic. It's more, it's more random. Uh, that could be associated with the process of acceleration and deceleration of the mass as it is detached from, from the base. Um, but the process, right, uh, about 100 hours uh, before the collapse is very linear, it's very steady. And so we see this linear decrease in the inter-event time as a function of, of time. What happened in 2020, we observed something similar. Um, if, you, if we focus in the, in the bottom, where we have also intervent time in hours, and then in the x-axis, we have time relative to the occurrence of the landslide. Right here, we have the occurrence of the landslide. We see, again, um, how the intervent time of the low-frequency earthquakes decreases linearly over time till we have the, the formation of the tremor and then the catastrophic collapse coming. Uh, where are the magnitudes of these low frequency signals? Well, I compare the amplitudes of the low frequency signals with uh, all the earthquakes that have been occurring in the volcano. Uh, and for those events that we have locations and magnitudes, so I, we compare the amplitudes and try to uh, get a grasp of how big are these events. And these uh, low frequency signals uh, have magnitudes between zero and two. Um, and a lot of these events are repeating signals. So if you compare the signal uh, of these events with the one of these events with uh, another that, that has passed or that has occurred, you will see that the, the signal is repeating. So it's coming possibly from the same source or really near nearby. Um, so, uh, but what is a repeating earthquake? Let's, let's consider the rate and state friction model that you all know very well. Um, so this is a long dip and this is a long strike. And let's consider a, a full patch that has different frictional properties that behaves in a more velocity weakening uh, frictional manner. And this gray area that represents uh, a full section that uh, behaves in a velocity strengthening or creeping uh, frictional matter. So this gray, uh, gray area is constantly loading the, the edges of this a uh, full patch that behaves in a more uh, weakening manner and is loading the edges till the frictional strength of the fold cannot resist the shear stress imposed by the constant sliding uh, of this section and then the fold goes off. And so the, the accrued, is, accrued is stress needed to rupture again is gonna be lower in the next time and so on and so forth till we have the rupture of the same asperity over time. If we are very lucky and we have stations around this um, full section that behaves in this matter and we record the seismic records of this for each of these station we will see that the signals are very very similar over time okay so it turns out that in in this i'm gonna i'm gonna move a little bit 
Um, so it turns out that uh, within all of these repeating signals or low frequency events that we have in 2020, we found 10 families of repeating earthquakes. So 10 families of repeating earthquakes were anticipating the occurrence of the landslide in 2020. We still need to go back and study 2014 and see if we observed the uh, similar, a similar pattern in the occurrence of repeating earthquakes. But thus far in 2020, we have 10 families of repeating earthquakes. And the, the waveforms that I'm showing you right here in the left represent one of the families. This is family two. Um, and you can see the similarity in the waveforms of, of these events. If we plot um, magnitude versus time, um, we observe this. So this in the y-axis, we have magnitude. And in the x-axis, we have days in 2020, in August 2020. And you can see that every repeating earthquake is uh, color coded by um, um, every repeating family, I'm sorry, is color coded by a different color uh, from one to 10. And first we have family two showing up. This is the first uh, family that, that is showing up. This is the second family that, I, oh, my, oh, sorry. This is the first family that I found, but turns out that um, it's the first family uh, that was showing up in the in the record. So family uh, two starts showing up, and then we have the occurrence of other families that accompany the occurrence of family two over time. When we plot the cumulative slip um, as a function of time, we see how the um, uh, family two starts dominating, starts showing up, and then uh, exponentially we have the increase of uh, or the the showing the the popping of different families that are. are uh, showing up before the, the collapse in 2020. So as the mass is accelerating, we have more and more families that are, are showing up in the, in the seismic records and uh, generating events right before the collapse right here in uh, August, uh, August 26. Okay, so let's go back a little bit to this figure right here. Uh, we have the, in the top panel, we have the spectrogram, as I mentioned before, we have the occurrence of the landslide right here in, in time zero. And then if we move back a little bit, we have tremor, and then we have the low frequency earthquakes. So this is uh, where, this is the observation. This is what we are capturing in the records. Um, and we talk about the increase of the amplitude in the seismic tremor right before the catastrophic collapse. And a question is, okay, what is modulating the amplitude of the tremor? What is causing this amplitude of the tremor to increase over time? And so if we think about it, um, the amplitude of the tremor is modulated by two factors here. Um, the amplitude is proportional to the seismic moment and the seismic moment is uh, modulated by the rupture area and the slip, the amount of the slip or the average amount of the slip uh, in these four patches. Okay, so if the amplitude is increasing, then um, the, uh, the, the rupture area must be increase, increasing or the amount of the slip must be increasing or these two factors must be playing some, some game between them that controls or modulates the increase in um, the amplitude of the tremor that we are, we are observing. And, and so the question is, okay, what could be happening here that is modulating the increase, the exponential increase in the amplitude of the seismic tremor? And if we go back to uh, subduction zones uh, uh, that I like also go back because they, they represent a, a frame to uh, study these processes as well. So if we think about it, um, let's, let's, let's set up this experiment. This, thought experiment where we have a region that has some um, full patches that behave in a more uh, velocity weakening manner that they, they rupture and when they rupture, they, they generate seismic waves. But these full patches are embedded in regions where um, they behave in a more velocity strengthening frictional matter there. They are constantly, constantly sliding and then loading the patches that are uh, that are elastically coupled in the in the in the interface, and then 
uh, bringing these patches to rupture. Um, so during the first phase of the landslide, where the, the, the movement is steady, uh, we have few patches right here, few of, of these red patches that represent the velocity weakening uh, rupture. Uh, and then in the first phase of the landslide, the landslide is going off, is, is detachment and it's going steady. It's loading these patches and is is rupturing a small asperities in the play in, in the interface. And so is start showing up as they start showing up uh, as, as low frequency signals because they, these are uh, yeah, events that are happening right at the surface, right? So these are low frequency signals that are rupturing. As the mass is accelerating, some of these patches that behave in a more velocity strengthening manner that are represented by, uh, by a white color can switch their, their frictional conditions and they transform to a more from, they transform from velocity strengthening to velocity weakening. Okay, this is, this is interesting because if that happens, we have an increased amount, an increasing amount of, of fall asperities that can rupture in a more seismically manner. So this process of transforming the frictional properties from velocity strengthening to velocity weakening is called transient embrittlement. And this is happening by an acceleration of the fold mass as, as the loading rate increases then the frictional conditions of these full patches that behave in a more velocity strengthening or conditionally stable manner can switch to a more velocity weakening frictional uh, um, conditions and they can rupture as regular earthquakes as we know it. And so if we, if we set up ourselves in this type of environment where we have a, a very stable, steady system where the mass is, is is slowly moving down. We have few patches of, or a few asperities that are rupturing in a seismic manner. And then as the mass accelerates, as gravity starts pushing the mass down, we have increasing loading rate. So the, the patches that are elastically coupled in the interface between the mass that is, uh, is being uh, moved down and the, and the base of the landslide, these patches transform the, their frictional properties and, and can uh, generate seismic waves. So among of these red patches that we observe right here, we have the occurrence of uh, repeating earthquakes that will represent the rupture of the same asperities or very nearby uh, asperities that are rupturing in a very frequent manner. And so they generate seismic waves that are very similar uh, over time. Previous observations of these rock landslides are very limited. There are very few um, in, in, in literature. We have uh, an event, for instance, uh, published by Yamada, Mori, and Matsushi in 2016, where they observed some um, low frequency signals that are occurred before landslides. Um, but it's not very clear if these are very low frequency earthquakes or low frequency earthquakes as we see in Irasu. Uh, they don't claim the occurrence of, of seismic tremor uh, before the, the occurrence of the landslides. Also in 2017, sorry, Polly uh, published a paper where he observed a, a landslide in Greenland and um, they, he, they observed the occurrence of precursor signals that occur before the catastrophic event. Um, in this particular case, there is no observation of seismic tremor, but they observed very similar events like in Irasu occurring before the landslide. And also in 2018, Chopa et al. published a paper showing the occurrence of tremor uh, before catastrophic uh, landslide in, in Iceland. Um, there is no low frequency earthquakes before the occurrence of the tremor. Although uh, for all of these three cases that I showed you before, this, the distance between the events and the stations is far compared to Irasu. So remember that for Irasu, we have a couple of meters between the epicenter of the event and the stations. But for these events, um, we have uh, kilometers. Uh, in between the epicenter of the of the event and the seismic stations. All right. So something, some other feature that is showing up in the data is that 20 seconds uh, before the catastrophic collapse, we have a silence. Let me go back to this figure, to the figure that uh, 
that resumes everything. This one, as you can see, we have the occurrence of the low frequency earthquakes, the tremor, and then the tremor increases exponentially. That could, could be modulated by, by, by the amount of asperities that are holding down the mass. And then we have this uh, moment of silence right in between the maximum amplitude of the tremor and the catastrophic event. So what is there? What is happening? And uh, this is this figure is uh, basically a sum in uh, window into the tremor and the catastrophic collapse. So before the tremor, or uh, I'm sorry, before the catastrophic collapse, we have this this window, which is about 20 seconds of silence right before the catastrophic collapse, right after the maximum amplitude of the tremor. And during this time, the amplitudes go back to almost zero. So right right like if you compare the signals to what was happening before the low frequency earthquakes the amplitudes are comparable so what is happening either why do we have this 20 second window of stable sliding with almost silence it's like the, the landslide stop during 20 seconds so our interpretation um is like if we go back to let me let me go back for a second. If we go back to the figure that I was showing you with the uh, this, okay. So our interpretation is like this: um, during the increase of the amplitude, we have an increasing amount of frictional asperities that are radiating seismic waves, but they increase so much because the loading rate increases exponentially. And so the amount of asperities that are right now at this particular moment where the mass is accelerating increases dramatically, these elastically coupling, coupling asperities are enough to provide uh, sheer resistance to the mass that is going down. But they are not enough to sustain the mass longer than 20 seconds. And then the mass collapses and catastrophically fails. So uh, if we can create a timeline with uh, what it was observed, first we have low strain rates or a period of stability where the mass is going down slowly. Then during this time, as the mass is accelerating, we have the appearance of discrete low frequency earthquakes that possibly was were triggered by this slow sleep, the, the slow movement of the mass that was uh, moving down downhill. Among of these low frequency earthquakes, we have repeating earthquakes, which uh, present very similar waveforms. And the repeating time or the interven time between these repeating earthquakes decreases linearly over time as the mass is, a pro is, is getting to the final collapse. And um, as the mass is moving down, the loading rate are increasing. And then as the loading rate increases, we have the switch in the genetic code that I like to call of these full patches or asperities uh, that initially were behaving in a more velocity strengthening frictional matter to a more velocity weakening frictional matter due to this transient embrittlement process. And then uh, finally, 30 minutes before, we have the merge of these low frequency earthquakes. They form tremor and the amplitude of the tremor increases exponentially. This increase or this exponential increase in the amplitude of the tremor is related to the amount of asperities that are um, uh, forming at the base or in the interface of the, of the landslide. And so uh, finally, right, when we have enough asperities in the base of the landslide, these asperities are en enough or big enough or the amount of asperities is enough just to sustain the mass for, quite, for a time of 20 seconds. And, but they are not enough soldiers to just hold the mass for, for a longer period and then the mass uh, catastrophically fails. And so this is the observation that I wanted to share. I hope that that was clear and you're interested in this observation because it's quite unusual. Uh, we haven't seen it before in other places. We have bits or pieces uh, of the puzzle in different places of the planet, but right here in Irasu, we, had, we have like the entire, uh, the entire panorama of what was happening or what is the seismic signal that anticipate these catastrophic, uh, these catastrophic events in, in 2014 and 2020. And as I said before, nature was repeating itself twice 
Uh, these are the records that we have, and this is the, the work that we have done thus far. Um, there's still enough uh, work to do. We need to characterize better the low frequency earthquakes just to understand better if they are low frequency earthquakes or low frequency signals based on their kind of frequencies and also study uh, the low frequency earthquakes in 2014 just to extract families of repeating earthquakes if they are repeating and follow a similar pattern as we observed in 2020. But this is uh, the observation that I wanted to share today with you all. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for, for the patience and, and, and hear me out. Esteban, thank you very much. I'll invite everybody to unmute if they'd like or to um, to turn their camera on if they'd like and to uh, yeah, join me in thanking you. It was really fabulous talk.